Welcome to another episode of Doug and Friends. This is Doug. I am. And here are the it. friends. Uh, today we're joined <laughs> by uh, Wade Stotts, the one and only Wade Stotts of The Wade Show, and a new friend, uh, Jeremy Carl, the author of a new book, The Unprotected Class, How Anti-White Racism is Tearing America Apart. Came out in the last two weeks, I think, right? Uh, it's actually been out since late April. But oh, late April. Okay, so longer longer than that. But um, but that's come out, and uh, and so we're here to talk about uh, anti-white racism and all attendant issues. So to maybe kick it off, Jeremy, thanks for being on the show. And uh, maybe tell us a little bit, of how did you get to write a book like that? Uh, I wasn't, didn't have any better sense. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> that was, I mean, did you lose a bet? Did you I lose mean, a bet? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was yeah. just, it was a bar. I woke up and I said, like, guess what? You know, sorry. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, this was an issue. I'd written about these issues for quite some time at, at the, both the Hoover Institution and the Claremont Institute where I am right now. And I, I really was, um, we talked a little bit earlier today. Um, I kept hoping somebody was going to write this book. And it was a little bit like a, a, you know, God telling Jonah to go to Nineveh and preach. And I really was trying to run away and not preach because I was like, ah, that's, you know, the folks in Nineveh sound kind of mean and, and tough. Yeah. And then finally I had a number of experiences professionally and otherwise that made me realize that I, I really felt called to do this, whatever the consequences of it were going to be. And I, I should actually note that they haven't been nearly as fearsome as I'd sort of expected at, at first. And I think uh, I'd like to, think that's maybe a tribute to the fact that I wrote a fair book about a, a very difficult subject. Yes. Like that matters. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah, well, so, so that may be true. So it's, it's, it's either a fair book on, on a difficult matter or they just haven't found it yet. Well, there's a little bit of both. A little okay. bit of both. Yeah. So, well, maybe, maybe we can help them to find it. Uh, well, maybe, maybe tell us a little bit about kind of just the central thesis of the book and, uh, and, you know, kind of what, what topics do you cover as sort sure. of evidence uh, that in, in the contemporary America, we live in a um, sure. kind of reverse discrimination situation. Yeah. I mean, it's, um, the, it argues that the kind of central type of discrimination and racism we have in the United States today is anti-white racism. And as I say in the book, and I'll say it again now so I can't be misunderstood, in no way am I suggesting this is the only type of racism that happens in America, nor am I trying to suggest that in the past we didn't have other, perhaps even more violent forms of racism that affected other groups. But I'm looking at 2024 what is the big one? And and I sort of came to the conclusion that it was anti-white racism. Interestingly, I should add, if you, even though people don't like to talk about it, if you actually look at survey data, when you ask white people about this, they will actually agree with that, that statement. Mm -hmm. um, but but it's, it's sort of forbidden to sort of say it out yeah. loud. Um, and what I do in the book is I kind of first give a lay of the land, and then I kind of talk about the civil rights revolution. And then I look at 11 different subject areas, and that goes everything from the church to entertainment, to the medical field, to the military, to big business. And I kind of document how anti-white racism and discrimination plays out in each of those fields. And then I kind of offer a reason why I think this is going on and offer then solutions for what we could do about it. Okay. Crime, crime was a big one. That crime is also a big, really struck me. A big one. And I actually lead off with that as, as a big one. Yeah. What do you think uh, for, if, you, if you're, if, if our, if somebody in the audience was um, skeptical, um, of, of of a, a kind of as a universal thesis. Oh yeah, maybe here and there, maybe college yeah. campuses, college yeah. admissions. I've heard about that, you know, affirmative action, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, what would you say would be some of the more like surprising examples as you did your research and, and put in there? What would be the places where people might go, really? Yeah. Well, you have healthcare prioritization by race that's happened. That was okay. kind of interesting to me. Okay. Uh, and then also like, not just obviously discrimination in who's getting into medical school, which we really don't want, I feel like in our yeah. doctors, but um, even like who's allowed to write and referee medical journal papers, things like that. So that even to somebody like me who'd researched in these areas was kind of surprising. I think the military was another area where, because that has a reputation as being a place, I think correctly where um, race relations has gotten, got better earlier and there are more closer interracial relationships of all types in the military. Um, I think it was surprising to see, particularly in the last few years under Biden, how much that's deteriorated to the point that, you have 40% fewer uh, white recruits signing up than you did five years ago because of their parents are saying, you know, this is not 40% really 40 drop in five years. And and just, to, this is not a, it's just among white recruits. It's not anywhere else. Everybody else is basically treading water. So that has substantial readiness implications because roughly 80% of our special forces are white. I mean, this is kind of the tip of the spear. Mm -hmm. This is a little bit of the James Webb born fighting Scotch-Irish. Like these are the people we're now telling 
like, eh, you know, this, this yeah. new woke military is not for you. And it's not just race, of course. I mean, I think there's some of the pride stuff and everything else. And know. foreign and, and foreign policy, which wars are we getting right. involved in? Things course. like that. Yeah, like, are we getting involved in wars in the national interest? Or are we sending, uh, partic- you know, like, are we sending a bunch of white kids off to be cannon fodder in places where, you know, we don't belong because we don't have an interest there? Yeah. So. Okay. So, um, Maybe maybe uh, drilling in just into definitions because I think people hear anti-white racism and they go um, at least thoughtful readers or listeners are going to go. What do you mean? What 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 are we talking about? Are we talking about race? Are we talking about ethnicity? Though sometimes right. those conversations. So h- how do you kind of navigate the race, ethnicity, whiteness? Sure. So race and ethnicity are definitely different things, and and we could kind of get spend the entire time talking about those differences. But I'd say very simply, like. I think an ethnicity can tend to be a little bit broader. It's, it's a group of people that feel tied by folkways, by religion, by by a whole bunch of other things uh, into a, a particular group. Um, I use white as a racial category here because that's kind of how our government uses it. I think if this is both, obviously it has some roots in biology, but it's also can be very culturally determined. And it's one of the things I talk about in the book is we have what uh, could be, has been called a flight from white. So you have a bunch of people when you look at census data right now over the past several decades who have a lot of white ancestry, but they may also have some amount, usually a minority, quite frankly, of non-white Hispanic or Asian or Native American. And and they are overwhelmingly and increasingly identifying as non-white because they perceive that to be beneficial to them in a variety of ways. And they're, they're correct in that mm-hmm. assumption, by the way. So I understand why they're doing it. Okay. So, so white really is, there's a biological rootedness and it's the sort of thing that like, if you were in a track, uh, certain diseases affect yeah. different different groups, different yeah. eth- eth- uh, racial groups yeah. uh, differently. So white's kind of more in that bucket. Ethnicity yeah. is that broader kind of cultural, shared story, shared religion. Sure. Um, and it's probably a little more porous, I would guess. Yeah, in terms absolutely. Of how you think about and, I, and I do want to be also be very careful. I mean, that I, I am saying like white whiteness is also a cultural category. In fact, sure. the left, I think falsely tries to say, oh, it's just a cultural category. Um, I, I don't think that actually bears up to scrutiny, but, um, but I do want to say that it is both. Yeah. Do you, any, any thoughts about kind of just as we, as we think about, uh, this phenomenon, what are, what are we talking about when we're saying anti-white, you know, how do, how would you think about the race ethnicity kind of distinction and categories there? Yeah. I would, I would want to say that obviously, um, the white category that the government is using and cramming down our throats Mm -hmm. and is pervasive in the media and the propaganda means that people will adjust their behavior accordingly. So I've heard someone once say, you don't, you don't have to choose sides in an ethnic war. The other side does that for you. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. So I, I don't have to go enlist in the whiteness brigade. Right. Because I've been conscripted yeah. by, the, by the government and the status quo to, to occupy that space. I can't do anything about it. Right. I also don't have any loyalty to my skin color. But I do have loyalty to my people, my family, my tribe, my lineage, my heritage, all the folkways and mores and customs that you're talking about. And those customs, because they involve actual people with faces, people that I know, have there there are breaks on that system, right? What do you mean? What do you mean? There's breaks on like right. in terms of like your loyalties and your loyalties, me- meaning uh, it it would be harder, I think, for an ethnic conflict to spiral out of control than for a conflict between a black mob and a white mob okay. to spiral out of control. Okay. You know, the yeah. mob has no history. It has no... Sure. The, the, so I, I don't want to have a loyalty to my skin tint. But at the same time, I have to function in a society where a bunch of people are factoring that in. And I've got to, I've got to do that too if I don't want to walk into it. So I, I distinguish between ethnic loyalties and bonds on the one hand, and then thinking like an insurance company, Uh right? So an insurance company doesn't want to provide auto insurance to a 20 year old boy with a red convertible, Uh, right? right? But they're, they're not making character. They're not assassinating his character. They're just saying that's not a good risk. Uh So if I'm walking down the stairs in a subway in New York city at 1am and I see two or three black guys at the bottom of the stairwell, I start thinking like an insurance company, uh-huh. right? And so do they, right. <laughs> right? Yeah, right? And the propaganda machine has told us you should feel, you should be guilt ridden for even thinking like that. Mm-hmm. You're right. clearly bigoted. Right. No, I'm just running 
running the numbers. I'm, I'm just running the numbers. Right? How, how much of the walking down the stair thing is the skin color versus the like, say, the clothing? How you I, know? You know what I mean? Like if if uh, if you were coming down and it was a couple, it was a couple of black guys or Hispanic guys, with, but they were, but it, they briefcases, were briefcases and ties and suits. And, uh, yeah, your 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 calculus changes. So, yeah, it affects that, and it also if it's uh, two or three white guys, Thug and out. Hell's Angle, Hell's Angels. Right. Uh, yeah. Geometry Club, Hell's, Angel, <laughs> yeah. Hell's Angles. <laughs> <laughs> a violent geometry club. Yeah. <laughs> that is the toughest kid to the yeah. classical yeah. Christian school. Right. So it ba basically, your your color is part of communication. Okay. Right. Um, because we communicate in a web. Yeah. And a, a lot of what we say is assigned to us. Right. Right. right? Yeah, um, and and that assignment also has to do with whiteness being so boiled down or so sometimes removed from being a being an ethnicity that it's being on time is considered whiteness right. and white <laughs> right. supremacy is, is expecting yeah. everyone to be on time. Right. And so, how how does that even fit in with? I'm curious how that fits in with the ethnic racial kind of categories. Or yeah, it? well, they're they're often used in ways. I mean, we we were talking earlier about like some Smithsonian. African American History Museum, I think it was, that sort of suggested that all of these things that we would, I think, just sort of associate as pro-social behavior that people could do regardless of race, but that they were somehow infected with insidious whiteness, and this was a problem. And I just wanted to pick up on something Doug said earlier because I think it's important. Like, this is not, um, this is not like a primary loyalty I want to have. This like battle was chosen for me, right? right? Mm -hmm. Like, it, it's like I exist in this web where. This is going to be taken into consideration. And I'm writing this again, not because, I mean, I've navigated the system effectively now. I was also older when it kind of got really bad in my view, but I have five kids and mm -hmm. I'm like, I'm seeing how this is affecting them today. And I'm seeing how this is affecting the kids of my other friends today. And that's why when I did this interview with Charlie Kirk originally and kind of talked about this, uh, he mentioned when he kind of talks with older donors and, and uh, supporters of his, they get very nervous. Oh, you know, you're, you can't even talk about that. And when he goes on campus and talks to students, you know, all the young white students are like, oh yeah, this is like the biggest problem that I'm facing. It's really bad. I'm so glad you're out there addressing it. So there's a real generation mm -hmm. gap here as well. Yeah, that's interesting. And, I, and it does seem to me that part of the challenge in it is that, um, you know, the everybody sort of acknowledges that the racialized uh, caste system that was present in America for 150 years, whatever it was. Mm. Um, that was, it was a racialized system and, and skin color mattered immensely for right. it. It wasn't the only thing that mattered because you right. know, some people, certain people got exceptions, but it was, it was a major player. And yet the solution to it, um, at least in the, in recent years has been to kind of double down on the system. And part of what you're arguing is yeah, double down on this, on this, on the system, uh, and just kind of move, shuffled who's in a privileged right. position. Right. right, as opposed to saying the system itself, this this way of operating, elevating skin color, elevating this racial component to sort yeah. of pr pride of place was part of the 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 major problem, and now we're just doubling down but moving sh yeah. shuffling roles. Yeah, just just a different winner uh, of the drawing this time, right? And so uh, this gets into Thomas Sowell and talking about the quest for cosmic justice leading to greater injustice. And again, I'm not trying to whitewash the history of the United States in this, which is was far from perfect. As I should add, I mean, this is not unique yeah. to the United States. I think this is true. Every country struggles with these sorts of issues. In fact, I think in many ways we've done a lot better than than most. But, um, you know, I, I am arguing, as I think you're saying, to not kind of double down on this, but that we should really try to focus on the inalienable rights that that everybody should be entitled to as Americans. Right. And 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 lead with leaning more into that ethnic category, which has the permeability because Correct. it does involve, um, while, while there may be a racial component or biological component, the ethnic category allows for um, change, transition, people coming in, people going out, um, and doesn't, like you said, has more breaks yeah. built into it. Um, and, and what you're interested in doing is getting back to a uh, an articulated ideal that was overshot. Correct. So when Correct. Martin Luther King said, not the content, not, not the color of the skin, but the content of the character. Right. Whatever else you think about King and right. other inconsistencies, that phrase right. sort of captured America's moral imagination. Absolutely. Right? Right. And and now it's been flipped around where if you bring up the content of someone's character, <laughs> why does that, that matter? That's white supremacy. <laughs> yeah. That's white supremacy. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, yeah. And, and you talk a little bit about the Civil Rights Act and 
I think uh, Curtis Yarvin and Chris Rufo in their discussion, um, Curtis Yarvin says something, well, what are you going to do? Get a law that says don't be racist to white people. You already have that. It's the Civil Rights Act. Right. And so it, it, seem, it seems like that's also, um, it's, it seems like a, an interesting point that the, the law itself may not say that, but that it's developed to the point where the reality is much more of a swing, cor swing the other Correct. Direction. And this is a really important distinction between the way I treat this and the way that some other people have treated this. I mean, besides the fact that my, my kind of view of the issue, I think is a lot broader than, than some of the other treatments, but that I, I don't, um, I'm not as critical of the 1964 act because I think it was addressing some real problems that we mm -hmm. needed to address. It was a blunt instrument to do that, but I think, uh, it was understandable that people wanted to do something. I think we just need to substantially adjust these laws now to deal with contemporary realities. And, um, but I also think that it's important to note if we snapped our fingers and got rid of all these laws today, a lot of this is very baked into the culture. And that's what I think Curtis is um, uh, kind of making that point in his debate with Chris Rufo. Yeah. Well, then to kind of um, one of the things that's been helpful to me in, in trying to process this, but kind of more on the theological and the pastoral side has been thinking in terms of, of uh, divine judgments. So in the, in the scriptures, you know, we regularly see that, that God judges um, his people for their unfaithfulness by, you know, turning them over to their enemies or by turning them over to their sin. So, okay, you want to, you want to live, this is the sin you, this thing about Romans one, um, God gives them over to the desire. They, right. they have debased desires. God says, fine, I'm going to give you over those debased desires. So in, in thinking theologically and, and kind of reading, reading the story, I, the part of the hypothesis I would put forward is that that racialized hierarchy that America had and doubled down on even after the civil war through Jim Crow um, was an offense to God. It was, it was treating, um, it was treating people um, wickedly and, and what ought to have been met with repentance on the part of a, um, a godly people, godly people would have repented for those sins. Yeah. And instead it took, it, it, that didn't happen. Um, it didn't happen or it didn't happen sufficiently enough or whatever you want to say. Yeah. And so then God uses a blunt instrument. Right. Yeah. So he, so there's, and so in, in some ways, I think that allows to say um, the civil rights act was, was in some ways um, a, a response to actual problems. Right. Um, but it was the wrong, it was a wrong instrument and that's now been weaponized. Right. And that we're and that part of the judgment of God on, on the nation is precisely living under a regime that has this really, really, um, uh, it's like a Swiss army knife. It can do, yeah. like, it can do all sorts of things. Like, this is your point. Like technically, if you look yeah. at it, like there right. should be no discrimination anywhere, mm -hmm. but it's like, at, but the way that it's been, um, uh, weaponized is such that you can have all kinds of discrimination in all kinds of places in the name of the civil, the civil rights act. Right. Sure. Um, what, what same, you know, maybe more at the generation gap, right? So we're, you know, different generations here, right? I'm a, a millennial, you're a boomer. People say that I am. You're, you're such a, <laughs> you're such I heard a rumors. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that keeps coming up a lot. <laughs> but I'm, but I'm curious what what your thoughts are about about that generation gap, especially because you've written for you know decades on on race and done so in ways that have gotten you in hot water from time to time. Uh, and so um, you know, but you but you were born into a pre civil rights. You know, mm -hmm. the civil rights movement was active. The Civil Rights Act hadn't been passed yet. So right. just any thoughts on kind of that generational transition? Are, are some people still stuck in 1968? And yeah, I, I appreciated the point that you made there where um, America, uh, white America, I'll put it that way, had a very uneasy conscience about the whole race thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I grew up in a segregated city and I went to the white elementary school it was a couple miles away and there was a black elementary school a block away. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, the uh, civil rights, the 64 civil rights act came down when I was 11 and everything was thrown into upheaval and uh, white flight happened. So my sister, three years younger than I, I was, went to the formerly all black elementary school and had two white students in it now mm -hmm. because of white flight. And, okay. but this, shows how complicated this is because a lot of the white flight didn't have to do as you demonstrate in your book it didn't have to do with i don't want to hang out with those yucky people who look di different than i do it had to do with crime rates and violence and right. cult cultural th cultural things right so there was a lot of white flight and then because in the grip of that uneasy culture you we had the sort of the Huxtable family narrative. Yeah, yeah. You know, no. the, the Cosby show 
was imposed on us. Mm -hmm. And I do think that a lot of um, boomers in my generation said, yeah. yes, that, okay. Yeah. Th that's Pause. This is the way it is now. That this is, yes, this is because this is the way it ought to be. And so therefore this is the way it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they've not gotten, a lot of them have not gotten out of that space. And they've continued to believe that that propaganda because of the uneasy conscience that went before and because of the effectiveness of the propaganda at the time, it was very persuasive, uh -huh. right? Yeah, I mean, I grew up watching the Cosby show as a kid. I mean, certainly, and that was kind of like a mental model that you had. I think that's that's exactly right. I mean, that, there was a very distinct political message that was being delivered there. And I'm also glad you mentioned the, the issue of white flight. And I, again, I document this a lot in the book. It's sort of one of the more subversive findings of the book where I kind of say, look, white flight was the form of ethnic cleansing in which the victims were primarily blamed. And, uh, you know, this is a complicated issue. I deal with some of those complications in the book, but that I try to show that very clearly you can actually even point in, in certain cities very dramatically, like Detroit and Newark, like white flight. I mean, it was happening to some degree, but it was huge riots, you know, huge violent riots in which, you know, dozens of people were killed and businesses destroyed often on racial grounds. And at that point, people just picked up and said, hey, you know what? Like, I can't live like this. So, uh, you know, these are complicated stories, but the kind of simple story that's often told of like, oh, these white people just left, you know, communities that they'd been in for hundreds of years in some cases, their families, because they didn't like people of a different skin color living next door. That's way, way, way too simplistic. Mm. Did, uh, when, was there any surprises that like other big, like when you were, I mean, you, you've, you've been writing on this for a yeah. while and then finally you kind of came to put it into a book. Yeah. Was there anything that you went in thinking, um, I expect to find this and it was actually upside down? Yeah. Either, either way, like maybe yeah. you thought this is, I'm clearly going to find this is going to be some anti-white racism and oh, actually it wasn't or, or the yeah. other way. I mean, I think I was a little discouraged at the degree to which some of this had infiltrated the military because I think that's okay. always been held up. There've been a couple of recent books that have kind of explored this as the exemplar and to say, eh, even in the yeah. military, we're having a lot of problems in this area. I think um, some of the entertainment stuff was interesting. There was, there was something I, sh and, and interestingly, this has actually been done by left-wing scholars who analyze in kind of painstaking detail numerically positive and negative portrayals in Hollywood by the ethnicity or race of mm -hmm. characters. And what was interesting is in aggregate, and obviously there were lots of stereotypes and other things going on, starting in the 1960s, white characters on average are portrayed more negatively than minority characters. Surprised me that it went back that far. That far. Um, I mean, you know, Hollywood's famously liberal, et cetera, et cetera. But it surprised me because there's a lot of propaganda um, I mean, I talk about the Twitter uh, feed, white people are stupid in commercials. Mm -hmm. I mean, these are kind of almost stereotypes even within the industry. The sorts of cultural messaging we get, even absent formal discrimination about whiteness and white people being bad and the way that white people even talk about themselves being bad and nobody will really call them out on it because it's kind of accepted in the media narrative. That The depth of that surprised me. Right, which is similar to the way that... Um, you know, you, uh, you're not going to have a leave it to be there beaver dad or even an Andy Griffith kind of dad in modern portrayals. The dad's always got to be the big doofus, yeah. um, who gets led around by everybody. He's, he may be fun, but he's yeah. got to be a doofus. There's a similar kind of like, it's a trope that's kind right. of worked its way pretty good into the, into the mental imagination. And would, is that, would you say that's part of the thing that enables now the more formal discrimination? Because I mean, I think like historically, yeah, those, those were often linked together, right? right. So you have, um, Blackface portrays African Americans in a particular way, and that's right. part of the the yeah. sort of cultural architecture that buttresses Jim Crow, right? Yeah. So, the, the, which is the legal regime, and so those kind of go hand in hand. Are you seeing a similar? I, I think that's a like it's way too smart a question for me to give you okay. a great, great answer to. I think it's probably going both ways, right? Yeah. Like it's like they're each reinforcing the other, right? To it, um, maybe uh, one, one question. Um, that I wanted to throw out there is uh, in, in the discussions about anti-white racism that have been, I think, I think it's, it actually is so some of the reason I think your book probably hasn't been as controversial is because it's so obvious, yeah. like in a lot of, and yeah. like in a lot of places, especially probably the folks who are, who are buying it initially in that first yeah. are going like, yeah, we, we kind of know this yeah. um, intuitively, but I want to see if the data backs it up and right. if, if how pervasive it is. Um, so it, it is so overt. Um, but part of the discussion has been, um, is is the left hostile to whiteness or are they hostile to Christianity? So you see, you know, and even uh, Pastor Toby has sort of said, you know, they, they say it's whiteness, but it's actually the Christianity underneath um, yeah. that's kind of in back of like Western civilization that's the true target. Is this a proxy war? Yes, yeah. Or is, or is it 
just simple Is it simple race. skin color or is it simple, yeah, simple yeah. race or is it actually a proxy war? Any, yeah, any thoughts on kind of how you think about the intersection of, uh, because oftentimes the left wants to bring these together. Like it's, right. they don't want it. So often it's not just Christian nationalism. It's white Christian nationalism. Right. Right. It's all, they, they want to add the word white right. in order to piggyback on the racial narrative. Right. Well, and I think, I think the, when people talk when the left talks about Christian nationalism, white is always implicitly put in front of that, even if they don't do it explicitly. So I right. think, um, I don't totally dismiss that element of the critique, but I think it's really important that I don't think that that's the full critique. And actually, Vody Bauckham wrote a really terrific book called Fault Lines that makes up a lot of my chapter on the church, um, really gets into this in, in great detail. And I think if this were anti-Christian, you wouldn't be seeing it in Bible-believing churches, but you are, right? Um, and in fact, as Bauckham really kind of shows in, in great uh, theological detail, every single element of this actually ends up substituting for the gospel. So instead of being told from a Calvinist perspective, we are all sinners regardless of skin color, but we're saved by our faith in Jesus Christ. We are told in this, uh, you know, weird version of substitutionary atonement or something, you know, um, white people are the people with bad, uh, they have the wrong color skin and therefore they have some sort of guilt. These other races are sacralized and, uh, and, and must be praised, you know, which is just a, it's a heresy from Christian perspective. Right. But yet, like, you'll find that implicitly in a lot of churches today. Yeah. And it, what do you think about the, you know, the way that this has kind of worked its way into the church? And, and what do you think about the proxy war question? Well, I think one of the complicating factors in all ethnic issues and, and race issues is the problem of self-loathing. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that's what I would probably bring up when you said, well, this is pervasive. This wokeness or this anti-whiteness is pervasive in white churches. Yeah. Uh, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, because the these people are watching television, they're yeah. imbibing media, and there are a lot of people who have guilt about things that I would argue you either shouldn't have guilt about, about it or you should and it's been forgiven. Mm -hmm. But you're trying you, you can't do anything if if your skin color is your total depravity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. You, you, there's Sorry. nothing you can do. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, well, that's, right. And that's why it's such a heresy. I mean, such a fundamental heresy and why it's not something that I feel like we can say as a church, oh, uh, well, you know, it's just like one of those things like that we don't do in an ideal way, but we're just going to let it go because there's other problems. I mean, this is a fundamental heresy in a really, really big way. I, I would add to this that in the providence of God, the Christian gospel spread west and north in terms of taking deep root. Mm -hmm. uh, there were missionaries to China and mm -hmm. whatnot, but it really took deep root in Europe first. Mm -hmm. And the Christian faith flourished there in various ways in Europe and then in the Anglo-American sphere uh, as we spread West uh, for a millennium, a millennium and a half. Mm -hmm. That's a long, long, long time. And virtually every white person you meet is descended from some sort of Christianity, you mm -hmm. know, overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the things that people talk about, that's whiteness or white supremacy, like the showing up on work on time, mm -hmm. are, the, are a cultural fruit of the gospel coming to a people and Cretans being taught not to be lazy and slow bellies and right. Right. go to get to work on time, Paul says. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. over centuries... When right. they, they do that, it becomes internalized. And that's why I tend to I tend to see it as a as a proxy war. If if the gospel had taken root in Africa and they were the not Europe and they were the diligent, hardworking, prosperous ones, I think the same thing would be going on only in reverse. With different different what do you think about that. I think that seems right. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I'm not going to get into any theological or church history <laughs> arguments with Doug. I mean, he's going to know much more than me. But I mean, it's, it's an interesting thought experiment. It's actually one of the reasons I particularly enjoy talking about this with Christians, because I think there's a, a really interesting debate and discussion to be had about it. And also, we also immediately want to get to a higher plane because we acknowledge for all of us are one in Christ Jesus, ultimately, right? And mm -hmm. and that there's always, we we never fall into this, or we shouldn't, <laughs> 
uh, I think, and even the people who do fall into it, we acknowledge that we shouldn't, this kind of secular trap of kind of saying that that politics or things going on in the state are the highest goods that we're aiming at. We always are aiming at something higher. We always understand there's something that is higher and more important than skin color or ethnicity or anything. And so I think the fascinating question for me as a Christian is like, how do we deal though with this reality that in, in 2024, ethnicity and race is still really important and we have to deal with that in a practical way in our lives, even if we, you know, our eyes are, are heavenward ultimately. And if I could push the other direction for mm -hmm. a moment, the temptation for those who see it as a proxy war for mm -hmm. the gospel do need to keep their feet on the ground and recognize that if they get caught in a dark alley or if they a victim of crime or if their kid doesn't get into the university they apply to, um, we're not talking about on the surface gospel issues. Right. We're, we're, we're talking about your last name. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and the yeah. photo that you so inadvisedly <laughs> in, right. in, in, included, included with, with that your application. Yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so it's okay to talk about the phenomenological point of you checked this box on your college application and right. it, it wasn't a box that said I'm Christian. And there are particular instances of non-Christians have facing the same issues. Right. So it may be a proxy war behind it all, yeah. but right. it's okay to say both, what's, both what's happening. Be, right. Both can be true. Sure. Right. right. And I had a friend many years ago with the Welsh name of Tong, who okay. got a <laughs> <laughs> who got a job <laughs> with the National Park Service. <laughs> um, much to their surprise. Much to, much to their surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, right. That's good. Um, maybe, but I, so I, we're in a minute. We're going to end with a you know where do we go from here and, and various responses. But I'm curious to kind of pick back to the the Constitution question. Um, because you're you're wanting to say this is the man who killed because because yeah, I, yeah I'm right. so as, far, as far as I, as far as I can tell I Locked think that up. you actually yeah, yeah murdered the, the constitution internet, the internet does think that I murdered the constitution yeah. um, so you know as you know you in in the video from a week ago you were sort of summarizing um, various different arguments Christopher Caldwell's book and a number of others on this um, on this question of uh, of is the constitution dead. Um, any anything that's come out of that, and 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 1964 and the Civil Rights Act often figures large in sort of as one of the big transitions, right? I think right. you mentioned it as sort of mm -hmm. we've you use Yarvin's, we've gone through a bunch of different constitutions. Right. Any any pushback that's come to that that has kind of made you think, oh yeah, this is another thing to say about it, or or any corrections, or do you right. feel like nope, I I still am, uh, that's that's what it is, folks. Sorry. Yeah. Well, I stand by what I said. I think that the um, the point about the Civil Rights Act being something that it, you you won't understand where we are right now by studying the text of the Civil Rights Act. Right. I think what, I, what I'm talking about mainly is the following laws, the ones that came later, much more in, the, in line with like Richard Hanania's yeah. uh, analysis. Um, but yeah, so I would say, I would still call that the civil rights regime because that's what it's become, right. yeah. to, come to look like. Um, but I, I would, I would, yeah, maybe clarify that. Still, still yeah. stand by what so I it's said. So it's not, it's not. And then that, and that's probably important because some people say, "Well, wasn't this a good thing in response to a real problem?" Sure. Which is your your yeah. point. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, but it sort of opened the door to a regime. Sure. That was kind of that they just drove a bus, big bus of discrimination through certainly. it. Correct. Um, yeah. Well, and it, it's certainly related to uh, the question of knowing where we are, and and sometimes it's it's not necessarily a question of and and learning where we are won't you can't go back to the text of the original Constitution. And you can't even go back to the text of the Civil Rights Act because many of those things, or, or the text of the Fourteenth Amendment, because it, what matters is how they became enforced. Uh, and so I, I find problems with the ways that those have been enforced. Uh, again, so so that these things initiated new periods where things became okay. So so the states' rights disappeared after the Fourteenth Amendment, and and the civil rights basically uh, ended up uh, like private associate, like free association, or things like that became. I came under fire. The, the other thing to keep in mind is the I would argue the Civil Rights Act, um, although it was a response ostensibly to a re, well, it was a real problem. But prior to in the prior to Martin Luther King, um, Thurgood Marshall was racking up a chain of uh, court victories, hmm. yeah. where he was winning yeah. case after yeah. case after case on the premises of the old system. Sure, right? absolutely right. In other words. Yeah. The, um, it it wasn't as though uh, the Jim Crow and all of those yeah. problems were a consistent application right. of the right. old system. They were an inconsistent application of the old system. And Thurgood Marshall was doing a great job cleaning up. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, the protests of Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Act really were unnecessary. And 
uh, were overkill, basically, and then provided an excuse to do what has happened. Yeah, well, you do see for certain a, uh, and again, this is not something you typically learn in school, but it, uh, even scholars will usually acknowledge this. You have a much better growth in all sorts of social indicators among African-American population in the 1950s before the civil rights regime really kind of gets going. And then afterwards, you begin to get riots and chaos and and uh, a lot of more negative indicators coming in. Hmm. And, but as far as the Constitution, and your, your thing was interesting. I'm, I think I'm a little bit more like... Uh, uh, Billy Crystal's Miracle Max and the Princess Bride, it's mostly dead. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah, it's not yeah. entirely dead. And right. I think that's actually relevant because it can be revived. You know, right. there, there's an essay right there that I need to write, you know, yeah. the, the Miracle Max Constitution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I think we can really revive it by sort of restoring some of the original freedoms that I think we lost in the Civil Rights Act because it was a blunt instrument. Um, and I think we, we can take, we can still pocket some of the wins that we got that were very real wins against uh, kind of discrimination against the Civil Rights Act, but we can kind of go back now to restoring more freedom of association among among other things and, and a, non, a real non-discrimination regime. Right. right. Yeah. Because the Civil Rights Act wasn't written so that uh, the guy in Colorado wouldn't have to bake a cake. Or, you right. know, yeah, yeah, right. of, it, wasn't, it wasn't intended that way, but it did go end up getting yeah. right, the expansion there. Yeah. Um, well, I think one of the things, um, as we turn to kind of think about um, various responses and reactions to the, the phenomenon, um, one of the things that I've, I've been thinking a lot about your your book contributed to this. I've been I've been working on a uh, kind of a follow on to my emotional sabotage book that's that's really zeroing in on the empathy question again, um, and kind of expanding that out. Um, but one of the concepts that's been really helpful when it actually comes from kind of the racial discourse is um, the concept of what I'm what I've called the progressive gaze, not G A Y S, but the G A Z E, yeah. uh, the progressive gaze, which is a it's a concept that I got from Toni Morrison, who's a black novelist. Because she talked about the white gaze, right? Living under the white gaze, um, and so she would do her writing, and she would basically feel like, um, you know, the ideal author or, or audience that she's writing for is a white audience, even though internally she's wanting to write about her black experience and write for like uh, you know other little black girls and things like that. But she can't shake this impression that there's there's a, a white guy standing on her shoulder, sort of yeah. censoriously evaluating everything she does. And so part of what she had to do as a novelist, she says, is had to kind of get rid of that guy just. Just flip them off. And I thought it was as a sort of a, a psychological concept. It was a really fruitful one um, because I think that part of the way that this um, in, infiltrated the, the church in particular, um, but I think probably society more broadly even, is um, living under the progressive gaze where progressive norms, progressive um, uh, ideologies were taken to be normative. And therefore, there's always a little progressive sitting on your shoulder evaluating whatever, whatever you do. And so if you want to start, if you, so I'm, I'm sure this is some of what, when you're talking about the, the reluctance to go to Nineveh, right. why don't you want to write this book? Some of that I would suspect is there's a little progressive sitting on your shoulder going, yeah, but if you do, you know, what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, for sure. and, uh, and so it's the, and it's, and it's the force of that kind of, of the, of, of all that we're talking about. Um, and it seems to me that's part of how, um, part of, it, embedded in that progressive gaze is, um, identification of particular groups that are sort of worthy of uh, compassion, pity, and empathy that are that are the rightful victims and that need to be protected um, from all from everything, and then the villains um, that need to be punished accordingly. So the the empathy often goes hand in hand. There, there's a, a I came across a Lewis quote. I didn't realize I thought that I'd gotten all my empathy stuff, most of it from Friedman, but Lewis has a has a quote um, where he says, um, "Pity when un, when separated from." Uh, morality and charity and justice leads through anger to cruelty. Mm. Pity leads through anger to cruelty. And he says, most of the atrocities that we come across are responses to uh, the other guy's atrocities. And and Lewis is putting his finger on something exactly right, that there's there's an empathetic rage that is often, this is the riots thing. Like, where, yeah. did, where, did that, where does that come from? And, 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 sure. and, and the indulgence of the riots is often a, well, right these are victims. And so everything they do is justified. Right. <laughs> um, and so there's a way in which like that mentality and that framing then smothers any conversation about, well, but wh what actually caused white flight? Like that, right. like when I read your book, that was one of those things that I just accepted the sort of standard narrative of, right. um, <laughs> black, you know, the black, the, the, the Huxtables moved in next door right. and all, and all the, you know, closet, the bigots moved out. all the bigots yeah. moved out. Right. Um, that's how I thought it went. And it's like, all well, the Archie bunkers. Yeah, sure. exactly. Yeah. All the Archie bunkers moved out and, and, in, and to actually see like, no, actually there were these seminal events that were massively destructive. Right. Um, that, that people with reasonable fears, 
um, or that were dealing with, you know, some of the other, yeah, just the the busing issues and things like that. And they were trying to work around all of this, yeah. this new legal regime. Right. Um, or, or a lawless regime as, as at well, various the, times. the fact that you're dealing with something um, deeply spiritual slash psychological, like empathy yeah. and envy and that kind of churn is um, seen in the fact that it can explode into a riot that burns down city blocks. Yeah. And afterwards, nobody is willing to admit what just happened. Right. Right. The, yeah. the, issue, is, yeah. the issue is not so much the riot because people have been, yeah. I mean, there's been urban unrest and riots forever. But in this particular setting, people will riot, burn down Minneapolis, uh -huh. and then act like they didn't just do that to themselves. Why did Whitey come in and do this to me? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, but, but I, it seems to me that one of the 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 needs then is to kind of you have to kind of get outside of that progressive gaze. You have to get out from underneath it sure. in order to be able to honestly, right? You know, take stock and so remindedly, you know. So, and I think that's one of the things I appreciated about your book is the is that that um, the acknowledgments of hey, this, this is what was going on. This is why there were the responses, and this yeah. was the result, which has been negative in these various ways because it's attempting to be a sober minded look at it, yeah. not an emotional one. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it, it took me years to get out from under that progressive gaze. And I'm still not out from under. I mean, it's still that little devil is on my shoulder whispering yeah. in my ear. Oh, you know, you can't say that. It's bad. It's mean. It's right. It's At least not, you know he's the devil. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's the devil. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I think certainly I couldn't have written this book at the Hoover Institution at Stanford for a lot of reasons. But one of them was just like informally that there were the, like, more devils, you know, on there mm -hmm. whispering. It was only when I kind of was able to get out to Montana clear my mind. I'm working at home. Um, the devil is a little further away. I'm focusing more on my family and everything else that I, you know, could get the clear headedness, I think, to really write this book. Yeah. And the, at the same time, one of the things I appreciated about the book is how steady, factual, disciplined the argument is. You're not, you're, you're not throwing adjectives around wildly, yeah. Yeah. right? You're, you're, but you make a compelling case is really, if, if, People are interested in facts as opposed to the narrative. Yeah, um, y your facts are going to disrupt the established. Well, narrative. That, that, and that was the goal. And I, as I think I mentioned to you guys earlier today, I mean, when I wrote this book, certainly super online people who kind of already know about this and have thought about it, I think even they will learn something. But I really wrote it even more for those sorts of folks to be able to give it to their mom, to their pastor, to somebody else who's maybe even a little skeptical or not, mm -hmm. and, and like. Nothing in that will they'll come away being like, oh, that guy was so angry. You know, the, the rhetoric was so overwrought. He used facts in a really deceptive way, but that it would really something, that, a book that you could give um, to, uh, to to just a fair-minded person and they would would, would uh, take it into account. And I've had that. I mean, I even had somebody buy 60 copies. They gave it to like a whole bunch of people <laughs> in their network. So yeah. uh, I love those sorts of people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, more yeah, of yeah, those. More, yeah. Have more of those. You do this instead of Christmas cards. <laughs> right. yeah. Here's, here's really a 400 wonderful. page book. Uh, so maybe let's talk a little bit about the kind of different reactions that might come because I think there's a couple that would be, that we'd be want to caution against, guard against and, and avoid. And then I'd be interested to hear, okay, so that what's the, the so what, okay? That phenomenologically we described it, but so what? So the, the first the first one I'll describe as kind of the, what I would say is the angry reaction that that folks are going to, so I think, and I would expect that some um, skeptics are going to be skittish precisely because they think, aren't you trying, aren't you going to stoke racial, right. further racial division right. by feeding into, right. um, you know, anti-white, you know, white people are going to feel justified, right. vindicated. They're going to go right. out and, uh, you know, uh, persecute their neighbors, their minority neighbors, yeah. or things like yeah. that. So, it, thoughts on like the danger of kind of like reinforcing an a, um, angry white, the angry yeah. white guy. I, I was going to say uh, the because there are plenty of bitter books about race that that would encourage the bitterness. So it, it yeah. wouldn't be yeah. insane for somebody to see the cover yeah. and think, oh well, this must yeah. be one of those. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I try to end on a very explicitly optimistic note. I mean, and so I think that kind of reflects the spirit in which I want the book to be. Written, obviously, when you write a book, as soon as it goes to the press, you lose control of it. Right. And people are going to take out of it what they can. But I, I have not gotten, well, I've gotten tons of really great letters. None of them have been like, ah, you know, now I'm going to want to go like hurt yeah. my minority neighbor as a result of, <laughs> right. of this book. I think, um, you know, what I'm hoping for this book is that it equips us 
to have that serious fact-based discussion um, and that, that people kind of feel like, ah, this is a problem, but how do I talk about it? You know, what evidence do I have for some of the things I'm seeing that I don't like? And then, so that I really did try to write something that's dispassionate to word against that. And then in almost every interview I've done about it, I'll do it again here. I mean, I really do um, caution against this victimhood narrative and mentality. I think it's bad for everybody. Uh, this is not about kind of trying to whine to some imaginary referee somewhere who's going to score a point for my team. It's about everybody being given equal constitutional rights, which mm -hmm. is something that I think we should all support. And it's like what, what, what has already happened again. I mean, I think that's done, mm -hmm. um, but we need to, to go prospectively forward with a more positive vision. Yeah. How, how, what's your thought on, you know, the danger and you two way like on um, white victimhood mentality? Like, um, you know, yeah. is that, is that we right to be concerned yeah. about that? How would we, how would you speak to that? If someone's tempted to, to sink into that? I think it's fair to say that nobody here wants a mirror image of white victimhood or whites mm -hmm. trying to claim right. a, a special victim status right. status. People are going to not let it, it's not going to happen. Don't try to make it happen. It's just yeah. not going to happen. Right. And it would be wrong if we could successfully get that. We, we can't uh, do unto others what we've been complaining about them doing right. unto us. Sure. So we, we should be wanting to get back to an equ equitable arrangement, not a, an arrangement where we are, um, have successfully seized the victimhood narrative. Right. That, because, because and, and the other reason for that, right, is always anytime if, if the, if the fundamentally a, a politics of victimhood, there's always got to be a villain somewhere. Yes. So somebody, somebody has to be, so there's always going to be an unprotected class. Right. Right. right? So if, right. If, even if you try to, you know, wrest control of the victimhood, right. you know, the, the ball of victimhood back to we, we have it now. Um, and therefore we get the, we get the privileges, the benefits and, and so forth. Um, you're just going to end up, putting somebody else sure. in the hot seat. So, and, and, uh, well, go ahead. I was going to say that the, um, you use the metaphor of a steering wheel on people's yeah. backs. I, I think that's a helpful one that we, we've, a lot of times people have seen um, this whole, the empathy game happen and that's how you get power. That's how you get some amount of sympathy or get, get sympathy for your cause at mm -hmm. least. And so I think folks would be tempted that way because that's the only way they've ever seen the game played. So I guess I just need to get my hands on the, you know, the back of the wheel for everyone else. Um, but yeah, there actually is, there are other ways of getting things done. There are other ways other than appealing to uh, people's most like sinful base instincts. Yeah. And that's, and, that, and that's where the fellowship of the grievance idea, I keep, I come back to that as like a, a real danger. So okay, you have, you know, because I think that that's what some people would walk away from is like, Oh, I've got, now I've got ammo for all of my right. grievances. Why have right. things not gone my way? Right. And so now it's, it's all kinds of blame shifting and, and refusal to take responsibility for what sure. you could do as opposed to, um, which is what you say, so you ought to take responsibility and, and get to work as opposed to, um, griping, moaning, complaining, and joining the fellowship of the grievance, which, um, aggrieved people are easily manipulated. Yeah. But there's something I would key off of something you said at lunch is, um, in this regard, it's one thing if there's a minority, 2% minority of, right. Um, in the United States right. and they're picked on and abused. It's, it's tragic. It's bad. It's, right. um, you know, okay. Yeah. We, it's a, it's a sorrowful, sorrowful thing, but it's not going to be a huge socially disruptive thing. It's, there have right. always been people on the margins right. who've caught it in the teeth and and right. and Christians oppose that sort of they want to stand up for that sort of person, but it's not going to it's not going to cause a civil war, right? If you're mistreating the two percent. Right. But the facts that are laid out in this book are so egregious and it's being done to the forty percent. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Yeah. And and at some point that forty percent is going to explode. Yeah. Uh, if if nothing yeah. is do, if nothing yeah. is done, yeah. there's going to be an explosion, and it's going to be ugly. And I believe that it's morally ne morally necessary for people like Jeremy to write books like this to give the magma a place to flow. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right, that's a great way yeah. to put it. Right, yeah. um, because if it, this is a situation that calls for leadership, mm -hmm. and the the problem is that in white America, particularly in Christian white America. The pastors are the ones who won't touch the third rail yeah. for anything. Pastors, theologians, and the people in the pews who have to get their kids into college or who have to navigate life at, in Dilbert world and the cubicle world, mm -hmm. they, they know what it's, it's like this college students you talk to. Yeah, yeah. thank you for talking yeah. uh, about this. That's going to go somewhere. And 
it's a tragedy that the people know more than the leaders do. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, <laughs> it's, right. and, and that's got to be reversed. Yeah. And that is going to require moral courage. Absolutely. And if, if, the, if the cause of the plague on Thebes is one guy, easy to get rid of. But there, there's a much more unwieldy, if the cause of the plague on Thebes is 40% of the population, right. that's yeah. not always going to be a group that will take that. Yeah. And so those, those people, again, if, if as much as those people want to fight back, uh, it could get ugly, but it, yeah, again, leadership is going to be. Yeah. But it, it's kind of like the, you know, the, uh, there's a, there's a, a meme. I don't know. Maybe it came from your book, uh, but I, I saw it. It was basically, you know, it was, um, you know, a white guy moves out of the city to the suburb yeah. and that's white flight. Yeah. And that's bad. And then he tries to move back into the city and that's yeah. gentrification also yeah. bad. Yeah. And at some point it's just, you're going to be, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. Right. You're breathing. You're breathing. <laughs> and, and you're <laughs> breathing while white. You're yeah. breathing. It's not, yeah. it's not, again, it's not right. good for anybody. Right. in America if we uh, do that. Yeah, so um, talk about a different reaction that I think is also kind of in place. So well, there's the angry um, leaning into the white identity, uh, cultivating cultivating a loyalty to, to white skin, which I think mm -hmm. you see usually in anonymous places on the internet at this point, but that's yeah. a real danger. We don't want that. You know, uh, be loyal to your people, but they're real people, not a skin color. Um, what what about the sort of, I don't know if you call it like the, the ironic, um, lighthearted response of something like White Boy Summer, where where there's this sort of, um, they're, they're le leaning into it, but in a kind of, um, it's a jocular internet sort of way yeah. um, that tries to kind of, oh, you know, we're so back and it's white, it's white boy summer. And it's not pride month. It's white boy summer now. Yeah. And um, that scene, you know, thoughts on, on that as a, as a response. Looks like little green frog summer to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's trying to find the humor in a sort of desperate way. Right. And I think that as in some level, I think there's a good instinct behind it in that it's a way to kind of talk about this without sounding aggrieved. It's kind of mm -hmm. like, okay. yeah, it's fun. And yet I think we were talking at lunch, you know, I think you see this as maybe a little bit of a, a dead end. Although interestingly, I was asked the, the, the only time I was asked now, now before this where white boy summer came up was a pastor, you know, yeah. asked me about it on, on his interview. So I think mm -hmm. it's, it's out there. I mean, in this yeah. meme and it's sort of, it's, it's expressing some of the unease, I think. Uh, maybe in a little bit of a safety valve type way. You, you talk in in the book a little bit about stuff white people like, right? Like Christian Lander. Yeah, Christian he did, Lander he did side, the book sure. and a very funny book. Um, yeah. And he he talks about how um, white people don't know how to talk about themselves yeah. unless it's in some kind of self-effacing way. Right. And so when we're trying to figure out how to even do that, it makes sense that we're going to have things that might be great and fun and other right. things that might be objectionable. But yeah. um, it does, yeah, what you said about it being a, a sort of, desperate way it's, it's trying to have fun yeah. uh, and, and it may be misguided but so you know, I, I, I think about this as a pastor with a um, we talked about total depravity with convinced views of total depravity <laughs> right um, if white boy summer stayed lighthearted right if it if yep. it stayed you know yeah. white guys on motorcycles having a good time <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, okay white boy summer fine and it gives me a kick that it was Tom Hanks' son. Yeah, Chet yeah. Hanks. Chet. Chet. Somebody yeah. said, if you name your kid Chet, what do you expect? <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's pretty funny, right? right. Like, like, you didn't see that? There's a meaning of judgment. Yeah. So the whole thing came back to bite him. But um, if it stays lighthearted, then that's that's one thing. But I am I see ugliness ahead, it, it, apart, barring a Reformation and revival. And ugliness, I mean, up to and including bloodshed and yeah. uh, just mm -hmm. uh, riots, yeah. Retali retaliatory riots, uh, you know, it, and at that point, I don't see the brake pedal on a white boy summer yeah. uh, right. thing. Yeah. I do see, a, you know, in ch Christian churches and denominations yeah. and uh, families, I, I see the brake pedal. Yeah, uh, but I don't see the. It, it's sort of like a a surly crowd at a at a soccer match in France right. mm -hmm. or, right. or England. Better. Mm -hmm. uh, right. They know how to do surly better, yeah. <laughs> yeah. right? But yeah, and once the once it blows, yeah, nothing you can do. The, the, the church yeah. is such a bulwark against that, which is why the the the. I mean, there's obviously many many reasons why the decline of the church in America right now is a tragedy. But but this is one of them: is that it just it gives a space where we all, regardless of race or ethnicity or background or whatever else, you know, we have that unity in Christ that is like right front and center, and we're practicing it if we're serious, at least every week, mm -hmm. uh, often, you know, more often if you're really involved in the, the uh, church. The lighthearted thing that I've, I've here a few years ago, somebody caused a firestorm on a campus somewhere with it's okay to be white po 
posters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. And that was delightfully understated. Right. <laughs> it's okay to be white and everybody mm-hmm. loses their minds. Right. Mm-hmm. That, uh, that is a pitch perfect response, I think. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. As opposed to, um, even if you're lightheartedly saying the Seahawks are better than your right. team, right? Or, uh, right. White boy summer, we do this better. Yep. If yeah. it, right. I'm just worried it, yeah. about escalation. And you talked before about the value of fighting like a cavalier and not like a thug. thug. And yes. so, mm-hmm. so the, it's not a, a sort of a criticism of having fun and, no. and, right. t- and joking about serious topics. Not yeah. at all. And not a criticism of fighting back. Right. We, right. we have to fight. This, this is right. this yeah. is unjust. It's right. wrong. And I, I, you're to be co- greatly commended for being the one who grabbed the third rail. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> any, we know it happens. We're glad you moved to Montana. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Any any final thoughts on like, you know, kind of that, that kind of that po- positive prescription? I mean, there's sort of some of the, in your, in your book, you do at the yeah. end talk about some of the try to recover sort of the notion of inalienable rights. You mentioned, um, you know, sort of uh, the, the content of your character, not by the color of your skin as a kind of ideal that we ought to aspire to in our political system. Um, are there other things that that would be that would act as um, places where this is what you should cultivate in order to do the right kind of resistance? Well, let me just talk about a societal break, and this is not about personal cultivation, but I think it's probably the most important thing we could do, which is get control of the border and deport people who are here illegally because immigration amps this up a thousand times because in the same way that when we had the big pause in immigration from 1924 to 1965, uh, and at the tail end of that is almost like the stereotype of all Americanness because everybody's had time to assimilate into a culture to have this identity that goes beyond just race or I'm Polish or I'm Italian. No, you're just American at this point, right? And similarly, if we can get, you know, we've got these we've got these groups of people here, all different backgrounds. If we're going to recohere into a unified American identity, we've got to turn off the spigot, you know, that mm-hmm. we've got on right now. I think it's the biggest thing that we could do is restore the rule of law around immigration. Yeah. And I would, I would add restore the rule of law in the courts Yeah, and not stop trying people in the media. Yeah. Uh, you know, where mm-hmm. something happens, you, you take a beat, you don't, um, right. You don't convict. Yeah. Uh, what you, you do is you say there's due process. Yeah. So, uh, which, um, you recount the whole, um, George Floyd thing. Right. Um, Derek Chauvin is Chauvin is in prison and ought not to be. Yeah. Right. Sure. Um, and, the, and he's there without having gotten a fair trial right. at, at all. Right. So that's a wonderful example, wonderful, uh, a very clear example of mob justice. Uh, what, ha- what happens when the people in the courtroom can hear the yelling from outside the courtroom? Right. Uh, we need the, we need the rule of law restored Sure. And um, and that would be a prime example. If I might ask a question, yeah, um, the, I think a lot of folks will finish this book and know that at some level before they start it that they have been wronged, or or that they in particular have been wronged, or people like them have been wronged, or their kids are probably going to be wronged. Um, I would be interested to hear maybe a conversation about this just being another subset of okay, you were wronged. It's, yeah, you know, Jeremy just wrote. 279 pages about mm-hmm. ways in which uh, people who look like my kids have been wronged uh, and in ways in which they'll have to fight things. Um, I, I'd be interested to hear maybe just a posture. Yeah. Uh, a posture, I mean, I, yeah. It, it seems to me that, you know, you live, you live in a fallen world and don't be surprised when the fiery trial comes upon you to test you. Don't, you know, yeah. don't be surprised that, that there's evil in the world, that there's, that there's suffering in the world. Um, and, and this is where, you know, again, that, that proxy war piece, can be useful, I think, precisely in that regard to recognize that part of the the hostility is toward Western civilization, towards Christian civilization, and therefore um, and therefore is downstream in some respect f- from it. And therefore, all of the stuff that the Bible talks about, you know, reading the book of First Peter about suffering um, unjustly. If you if you if you suffer unjustly, so did Jesus. Yeah. yeah. And and so that and so that you've got you've got a model for unjust suffering, and you can continue entrusting yourself to the one who does judge justly. So you're entrusting yourself to God, which doesn't mean you just you just completely roll over and say, well, I guess we don't have to do you know we shouldn't close the border and right. we shouldn't have the rule of law because mm-hmm. suffer unjustly. It means when as you try to pursue justice 
in society. You're doing so from a place of acceptance with God, justification before God, mm -hmm. um, and not a place of resentment, bitterness, and just trying to grab the levers of power so that you can get revenge on those who've wronged you. Yeah, right. And it's it's important to teach your kids, instill in them a overcoming attitude. Okay, these are big obstacles. We are not supposed to be resentful and sullen about the presence of da dragons. We should train our kids to be dragon fighters mm -hmm. and to enter into it with a cheerful mm -hmm. Christian disposition. Um, Thomas Sowell many years ago wrote a book called Pink and Brown People. Mm -hmm. And it was great. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pink and Brown People. Um, and in that, he talks about the difference in achievement between blacks who came to the States from the West Indies mm -hmm. and blacks who were not from that line. Yet. Yeah. And the, the blacks from the West Indies were just high achievers, uh, top echelons. They it's like the, the Vietnamese or the right. Chinese who come here. Yeah. They, they excelled mm -hmm. and other blacks didn't, but racists or a racist society wouldn't be able to tell where your great grandfather lived. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, they're just going to, Winnow right. out, but those people, one sort of one type of person, um, be, was an overcomer. They, mm -hmm. they, and years ago, many years ago, um, I was teaching a class at a. There was a little black kid in it. He was a, he was kind of a pill, and the other kids didn't like him because he was a pill, and he wasn't doing well in class. And I remember vividly the parent teacher mm -hmm. conference I had with his mom, and she was convinced that. The other kids didn't like him because he was black. And and that wasn't the case. But I didn't argue with her at all. I said, well, I'll just take what you're saying at face value. You believe that your son is living in a society where he's going to work have to work twice as hard to get the same result. And I'm telling you as his teacher that he's currently working half as hard. <laughs> <laughs> now, yeah. you tell me what's going to happen to him right. in the society you believe he's in. Right, right. Well, I accept the fact that in, if you read this book, um, white kids who are brought up in a godly home are going to have to go the extra mile, the third mile, to, right. to mm -hmm. get the same distance under the current regime. So they should do that cheerfully. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. 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 That's, yeah. that's the message. Yeah. It would do what you got to do. For sure. Very good. Well, thank you guys. This has been another episode of Doug and Friends. We'll be back next month uh, once again. So um, until then, um, enjoy your summer. <laughs>